Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. On December 8th, 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared that yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. Does it? Do you remember what happened on that date? Any of you, do anybody remember that day? What other dates do you, or days do you remember from history? How about October 31st, 1517? Ring a bell? I hope so. We celebrated Reformation Sunday last Sunday. How about December 17th, 1903? Anyone? Larry, Larry probably knows it, the colonel. The date the Wright brothers had the first manned, sustained flight of a manned aircraft, December 17th, 1903. Talk about a world changer, right? But did you remember the date? How about something a little more recent? This is like a layup, September 11th, 2001, a date that we said we would never forget. On the internet, there are lists of dates that we should never forget, some of which I had never heard of, which got me to thinking about how quickly we forget things. And even if we don't forget that things happen, we neglect or deny to assign it the significance that it actually had or should have in our lives. You see, the world changed when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And it set into motion a series of events that culminated with the end of the last world war. But not before we dropped two atomic bombs upon Japan. I hope we never forget the long-lasting pain and devastation that that decision created. The truth is that we do forget from one generation to the next. We forget what we've endured and the consequences of our actions. And we forget who and in what we should place our trust. The pain, this painful reality is demonstrated in our reading from 1 Kings this morning. The very people of God have forgotten who Yahweh is. And they've forgotten their status as the people of God. They've forgotten what their ancestors endured and what they accomplished. I think that's one of the reasons that an All Saints Sunday is so important. So that we don't forget who God is. So that we don't forget our ancestors and what, who have gone before us and what they endured and what they have accomplished and how we today are standing upon their shoulders. But it's easy to forget that, to deny that, to gloss over that and pretend like the world started when we were born. May 24th, 1970, a day you'll never forget, right? Ma? Ma? The people in the northern kingdom of Israel seem to have forgotten their ancestor, David. They've forgotten him and the God that he loved and the God who also loved him. Our reading this morning comes about 75 years after the, the kingdom split and the northern kingdom was created, which we read about last Sunday. It's during the reign of King Ahab, who was the sixth king since King Jeroboam to serve the northern kingdom. Oh, Ahab was infamous. He's described elsewhere in 1 Kings as having done evil in the sight of the Lord, more evil than any other king before him. It's good to make a name for yourself, I guess. Ahab was responsible for the proliferation of the worship of Baal, including the building of a temple and an altar for Baal in the Israelite capital of Samaria. As a result, Elijah, who was a prophet of Yahweh, and Ahab didn't get along so well. Our reading begins with Ahab accusing Elijah as being the troubler of Israel. 
as if it was Elijah who brought about all the trouble in Israel, where very clearly from Yahweh's perspective, it's Ahab and Baal who are responsible for the problems that Israel is facing, including a three-year drought. Now to demonstrate that it was Ahab and Baal who were the source of Israel's trouble and not Elijah and Yahweh, Elijah challenged Ahab to a duel. It sounds kind of like a a playground conversation between two kids saying, well, my dad's bigger than your dad. My dad's stronger than your dad. My dad's smarter than your dad. My dad is richer than your dad. And who wouldn't brag if you got Yahweh backing you up, right? Nothing to worry about. So Elijah calls out the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and then he spoke to the people accusing them of limping along limping along too wishy-washy to make a decision about which God they're going to worship. They're going to worship Baal, they're going to worship Yahweh. You see, Elijah wanted the people to choose, to make a decision, to stand firmly in their faith, in their trust in the one true God. Now we read that after the bull was, was butchered and, and cut into pieces and laid on the wooden altar... The people then began to call upon the name of Baal. From morning until noon they called out, and yet they didn't receive an answer. Or actually, I guess they did receive an answer, and the answer was no. There's no voice, there's nothing coming from, from Baal. And ironically, Baal was considered to be the god of rain and lightning, and here they were in the midst of a three year drought. Baal hadn't made it rain, and now Baal couldn't send down lightning to start a fire on this offering. No rain or fire appeared. So Elijah, like a boy on the playground, mocked the prophets. (laughs) Seems as though my God is bigger than your God. Your God is just too busy to show up when you call upon him. He's wandering around or asleep or on the toilet. He accuses Baal of being, all very human things. Your God is tending to human things, too busy to hear you calling. And then Elijah gathers the people a little closer to him as he begins to prepare his sacrifice. He's given them all morning, Baal all morning to show up, and he hasn't. And then he gathers 12 stones, one each for the 12 tribes of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And he placed them together, he built an altar, and then he dug a trench around that altar, and he placed that butchered bull, a butchered bull upon it and poured four jars of water over the bull, over the wood, into that trench. Not once, not twice, but three times. Twelve jars of water in the middle of a drought, Elijah poured over the sacrifice making it good and wet so no fire could start. You know, he just upped the game a little, right? Like, I can make this this shot with my eyes closed. You see, when this happened, then Elijah began to pray. He didn't cry out to God or plead with God. No, Elijah prayed to the God of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac and Israel. God prayed not that fire would come, but that God would be known in Israel. Elijah didn't pray for fire, but he prayed that the people of Israel might remember who God is and who they are as the chosen people of God. Elijah didn't pray that Yahweh would show Baal up and make that blindfolded shot. That's not what he was worried about. He prayed that Yahweh would be known. This wasn't about bragging rights. Elijah didn't set up this contest simply to prove that his God was better than Baal, which obviously he is, but instead to show the people who God is, that they might come to know the one true God, the God whom their ancestors had worshipped, the God who King David had moved into the center of their life together. We read about a couple of weeks ago that when David becomes king, he moves the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem so that it might, God might be at the center of their life together. It's as though the people have forgotten. 
When Elijah prayed that the people would turn back to God, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed that, bur- that wooden offering. The wood, the cow, the bull, the stones, the dust, the water, gone. All of it is how hot that fire was. Seeing this, the people fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, the Lord indeed is God, the Lord indeed is God, just as Elijah had prayed that they would. Elijah set up this entire contest with the goal of reminding the people who God is. He began, if the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, follow him, knowing full well who God is. Elijah's goal was met. The people saw the Lord is God, and they began to worship. And they worshiped God. They didn't worship Elijah. They worshiped God because he was the one who actually had performed this miracle. And Elijah, as a prophet, a true prophet of God, not a false prophet, was careful to to ensure that the people understood that it was Yahweh who brought the fire down. This wasn't a trick that, that Elijah did himself, but Yahweh, working through him, through this circumstance, revealed who God is. I suspect, I hope, that each of us has encountered people like Elijah in our lives and in our faith journeys. You know, people who seem to have a knack for drawing our attention to what God has done, drawing our attention to what God is doing. We might not refer to these people as prophets like Elijah, but maybe we describe them as saints. Saints, it's a term that we used to think was really only in the domain of the Roman Catholic Church, but we know saints to be those people in our lives who've had an impact upon our lives, especially upon our spiritual lives. Now as Lutherans, we know that Luther would caution us to make sure that we don't build too tall a pedestal for those saints because those saints are not perfect. Simultaneously saint and sinner, they're not perfect for nobody is perfect except through the perfecting blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But they are significant and these people are important because they were or are loved by God and they have shown that same love to us. Each of us, I pray, can remember or reflect upon at least one person. At least one situation where we have experienced God's love through the love of another. And as that situation comes to mind, it may not seem that significant. Because it's not fire raining down from heaven burning up an offering like happened with Elijah. But those events, those circumstances are no less important if they in fact drew your focus upon God and God's love. On All Saints Sunday, we pause to remember those whom we have lost, especially those we've lost this past year, but all people who have revealed who God is through their acts of love and their lives of generosity. We acknowledge them and we give God thanks for them, not only because we loved them and they loved us, but especially because God loved them. And God has used them to reveal God's love to us. Elijah prayed that the people would know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And I suspect somebody has prayed that for you. Pray that you too would know of God's gracious, life-giving love. The love that your, your ancestors fought to make sure that was known to others in your family. And all those ancestors are not biological, my friends. They're your family, your church family, your neighbors. People who've prayed for you, teachers who've prayed over you. People you didn't even know were praying for you. That you might not forget. Forget that you were lovingly created in the image of God, a child of God. 
Elijah prayed that the people would know God. So today, let us give thanks for Elijah, a prophet, a saint. And let us give thanks for all the saints who have revealed that the Lord is indeed God. And then in response, let's do as Elijah prayed. Let us follow him. Amen.